Come with me on a journey to the land of secrets and esoteric mysteries. Right. Well, I need a packed lunch. What? The Fool's Journey! <laughs> now that the Fool has learnt of willpower and skill, he continues along his path and is soon faced with a mysterious-looking woman sitting between two pillars with a rather posh-looking veil hanging between them. Welcome. I'm the High Priestess, and I'm here to show you how to look within yourself for the answers you seek. Ooh, thank you. That's a very nice curtain. What's behind it? Never mind. Now shut up and listen. Have you spoken to the trickster? You mean the magician? Yeah, he told me to tap into my self-confidence and skill so I can manifest my deepest desires. Excellent. But without intuition and self-knowledge to guide you, you'll soon find yourself lost and without focus. You need to take control of your unconscious mind, or someone else will. Don't think about elephants. You see how easy it is for people to plant ideas in your head? Remember, you are not your thoughts. You are so much more. Now go forth into the world and follow your instincts to discover your true destiny. Okay, thank you very much. Can I think about elephants now? <sighs> the fool soon finds himself at a fork in the road. Hmm, which way should I go? Use your intuition, Luke. I mean fool. Eventually he chooses a path and continues along his merry way. To be continued. Welcome back to Kippy's Quest and Tarot School. This week we're going to be looking at the card number to two in the tarot, the High Priestess. The previous card in the Major Arcana is the Magician, and as we saw in the last video, we can see him as the outer, more physical aspects of skill, willpower and confidence. Conversely, we can roughly see the High Priestess as the inner qualities of intuition, understanding and gut feeling, although the imagery in this one goes much deeper. Arthur Edward Waite gives his brief divinations as secrets, mystery, science, divine femininity, tenacity and wisdom. If we go further back in history to the Tarot de Marseille, this card was known as La Papesse and was based on Pope Joan, the legend of the female Pope who disguised herself as a man in order to be elected to the papacy. The story goes that she got rumbled when she spontaneously gave birth during a procession. Now this particular tale has been in circulation since the 13th century and has been widely discredited, but it did give people a wonderful opportunity to mock the Catholic Church, in particular the Estacoraria chair a device that was supposedly used to confirm the sex of the newly elected Pope by getting him to sit on it and pop his wedding tackle through a hole in the seat. Some lucky chap then got to put his hand underneath and verify, in the most intimate way, whether he was genuinely male. Following this most reverent and sacred performance, it would then be exclaimed, Duos habet et bene pendentes, which is Latin for, he has two and they are hanging well. Again, there's no evidence that this actually happened, but you can imagine the hilarity amongst the common folk of the 15th century, especially at a time when the church wasn't exactly known for its tolerance or sense of humour. Christianity has never been particularly enthusiastic about tarot cards, and while La Papesse isn't the only reason for that, I would say that it probably didn't help. Excuse me, what exactly does this have to do with me? I'm sorry I digress. Let's move forward to the Rider right Waite card. Thank you. I look much better on that one. We can see that some significant changes occurred here. Interestingly, Arthur Edward Waite chose to remove Christian imagery from some of the cards while adding it to others. In this one, he chose to go more in the direction of the Kabbalah, moving away from La Papesse and presenting the High Priestess as the Shekinah, which Waite describes as the spiritual bride of the just man. And when he reads the law, she gives the divine meaning. Another connection to the Kabbalah can be seen in the design of the veil which seems to show palms and pomegranates arranged into the positions of the spheres on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. The Kabbalistic what? A brief history of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is a diagram from the esoteric school of the Kabbalah as a way of illustrating ten emanations of supreme consciousness. These spheres, known individually as Sephirot and collectively as Sephira, are considered to be aspects of divinity, reality and human experience. The top Sephirot is called Keta, which means crown, and represents the highest aspects of consciousness and creation. The bottom Sephirot is called Malkut, meaning kingdom, and represents the physical world. The journey from the highest Sephirot to the lowest is often thought of as the manifestation of a concept, from idea to tangible reality. The tree is further divided into three pillars. On the left is the pillar of severity, on the right the pillar of mercy, and in the center is the pillar of mildness. Yes, the spheres have the same name as the bad guy from Final Fantasy VII, and yes, I totally freaked out when I realized that. Nerd! 
The 10 Sephirot are connected by 22 paths, and these have many correspondences, including the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and, of course, the 22 tarot cards of the Major Arcana. If you've watched the previous videos, you'll know that we talk about those in Correspondence Corner. The High Priestess sits on the path before the highest three Sephira, known collectively as the Supernal Triangle. This area of the tree lies beyond what is known as the Abyss, and is thought to be the highest attainment to a student of magic. It is therefore hidden by the veil that hangs behind the High Priestess. And you thought it was just for decoration? According to Alistair Crowley, in this card is the one link between the archetypal and formative worlds. Lon Milo Duquette writes in Understanding Alistair Crowley's Thoth Tarot, as the only middle pillar path that spans the Abyss, the position of the High Priestess on the Tree of Life is unique. She links the ultimate father of Keter to the son of Tiferet, and in doing so, joins the supernal triad to the rest of the tree. The High Priestess sits between two black and white pillars, one marked B and the other J. These stand for Boaz and Yachin, the pillars from the mystical temple of Solomon. According to the Old Testament, the temple was a place of assembly for the Israelites, and was home to the Ark of the Covenant. The Testament of Solomon tells of how he commanded the demons to build the temple after a magic ring was given to him by the Archangel Michael. Take, O Solomon, King, son of David, the gift which the Lord God has sent thee, the highest Sabaoth. With it thou shalt lock up all the demons of the earth, male and female, and with their help thou shalt build up Jerusalem. They also represent the left and right pillars on the Tree of Life, the left being severity and the right being mercy or grace. The High Priestess sits between the pillars as an example of the perfect balance between these opposing forces. Aren't you going to compliment me on my outfit? According to Waite, the vestments are flowing and gauzy, and the mantle suggests light, a shimmering radiance. On her head she wears a horned diadem with a globe in the centre. This is reminiscent of the threefold moon symbol, which represents the three phases of the moon, an important symbol in neo-paganism. Likewise, the High Priestess' clothing is closely related to Isis, the Egyptian goddess mother of Horus, who was thought to help the deceased reach the afterlife. On her breast, she wears a solar cross. It gets a little confusing here because despite the name as an astrological symbol, it actually represents Earth, with the four sections denoting the four physical elements, which again correspond to the suits of the Minor Arcana. In her lap, we can see a scroll marked with four letters, T-O-R-A. Part of the scroll is hidden beneath her gown, which leaves us to speculate on the final written letter. The obvious guess here is that it's spelling out the word Torah. This would refer to the Sefer Torah, the written scroll of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians refer to as the Old Testament. Some have commented that it could also be spelling out Tarot backwards. Personally, I believe that the purpose of leaving the whole world partly concealed is to allow it to refer to both. Waite says the scroll in her hands is inscribed with the word Torah, signifying the greater law, the secret law, and the second sense of the word. It is partly covered by her mantle, to show that some things are implied and some spoken. At the High Priestess's feet, we see yet another moon and another reference to the Bible. In this case, the lunar crescent is thought to hint at the woman of the apocalypse, or woman clothed in the sun, as described in the book of Revelations. Now a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. It goes on to say that she gave birth to a man-child and was then attacked by a fiery red dragon. But fear not! Unto the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she's nourished, for a time, and times, and half a time. That is literally what it says. So we can see that Waite didn't completely do away with the Christian concepts, but the references to the woman clothed in the sun also spill onto the next card, the Empress. And we'll be looking at that one in the next video. Now if we flip the card upside down, we could say that a reversed High Priestess indicates a move away from the inequalities of intuition and into more outgoing and gregarious aspects. Rachel Pollock suggests in 78 Degrees of Wisdom that the card reversed signifies a turn toward passion, toward a deep involvement with life and other people. But she goes on to warn us that that can make us lose touch with our inner selves. Correspondence Corner! The High Priestess sits on the 13th path of the Tree of Life between Keter and Tiferet. She corresponds to the Hebrew letter Gimel, which means camel. Her musical note is G-sharp. <coughs> the High Priestess's herb is peyoni, and her astrological symbol is the moon. I think the practical takeaway for divination is the concepts of intuition and gut feeling. And realized potential is also a huge part of this one. Ideas living inside us that we don't always see. When we look at the Tree of Life, it shows us that raw potential is the highest aspect, and that works its way down through all the Sephirot to the physical world. 
Therefore, the High Priestess is one of the cards that represents our highest selves, the part of us that tends to get things right all the time. Doesn't mean you always listen, though, does it? Thank you for tuning in to Kippy's Quest. It's been splendid to see you. Give my love to Auntie Marge. May the coming days bring you reflection, understanding, and the intuition to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Until next time.